Amid the ongoing war in the Middle East with Israel pummeling Lebanon, the United States and actually a number of other countries are trying to instill a 21-day ceasefire to try and prevent this war from blowing out of all proportion. That's going to be a little harder than it may seem because you seem to, there seems to be some discrepancies, to put it charitably, between what the United States wants and indeed most of the world and Israel. And we're going to look into that today. And what we're going to find is that there are some serious disconnects, which have significant implications for regional security in the Middle East and even for America's national security writ large, especially if we somehow get sucked into yet another war. Now, uh, first of all, I want to talk about what Netanyahu, because he has been pretty clear about what his objectives are. And he said this earlier today. We're determined to return our residents in the north safely to their homes. We're inflicting blows on Hezbollah that they did not imagine. We do it with power. We do it with ruse. I promise you one thing. We will not rest until they return home. Okay, and, and the they he refers to there are the approximately 70,000 Israeli civilians who have been forced out of their uh, homes uh, along a strip. Uh, actually, I think I can actually show you that real quick here. Uh, along the strip in the in the Gaza, uh, I'm sorry, in the northern part of Israel, you see this this uh, light blue area here. This is this is the Lebanon. This is Israel. This is the northern border. Uh, so you can kind of see where that uh, is in the larger scheme of things. Uh, this area here is basically where a lot of the civilians have been forced out. So this is a no man's land at the moment because there are rockets, mortars, and other things on the uh, Hezbollah side of the Lebanese border where these clashes between the two sides have largely been falling. And so there's lots of political pressure on Netanyahu, has been for quite a while now, for him to uh, clear this out so that he can bring the, the people back into their homes. So when he says with declaration in that clip I just played that we are going to uh, you know, do whatever it takes through all these means to bring our people home, that's what he's talking about. Now, that is a huge and monumental task because in, in just the last like several days, there have been many hundreds of people killed in Lebanon. And, and some of them has Hezbollah, some of them are just civilians as well. And Israel has now been pummeling, especially in the southern part, north along the border, just devastating large portions of that, uh, of that region. So in light of this and in concern that this could escalate the war, which the United States has been worried about from day one, that this war from October 7th forward in the Israeli response is that it not escalate into a larger war. Nothing with, the, you know, and since that time, it's already happened to a large degree in that Hezbollah has been doing rocket attacks back and forth with Israel from literally from the second day of the war forward, from the 8th of November of last year forward. And then subsequent to that, the Houthis got involved by attacking shipping in the Red Sea. We've also had some of these uh, Iran-backed militias in the region have been getting active. Some of them have even killed Americans in the process. So it's been kind of outside already, but it's been still largely contained. But with this now overt declaration by the Israeli side that they are going to do whatever it takes to bring to allow their citizens to safely go back into their homes there, you have the risk of a significant escalation of the war, not just a peripheral issue. The United States then, in com combination with a number of our allies in the, both the region and in Europe, have proposed a 21-day ceasefire. Uh, Secretary of State Blinken was asked on MSNBC earlier today what that would look like. For Israel, um, there is a strong, strong desire to create an environment in which people can go back to homes, kids can, kids can go back to school. Um, and any country would uh, feel the same way. Now, we believe that the best way uh, to get that done is through diplomacy, uh, to get an agreement that would create a secure environment, forces pulling back from the border, people having confidence uh, to go back to their homes. Conversely, getting into a full-scale war <laughs> is not the way to achieve that objective. There's no way in that uh, situation that people are going to be able to go back. So you have much of the world coming together calling for this 21-day ceasefire to give us some time, to give us some space to see if we can get a diplomatic resolution that creates that environment. Now, I, I think that he's barking up a wrong tree here, that there's not going to be any interest in a negotiated settlement either by the Hezbollah side or the Israeli side 
because the, the, the Hezbollah side is the only way that there's a quote negotiated settlement is if they leave and go back north of the Latani River, about 25 kilometers uh, north of that border I just showed you a second ago. And Israel has no interest in having a negotiated settlement of any sort anywhere. They want to win whatever they want to accomplish by military means, and they don't have any interest in doing anything else. So I'm not sure what the 21 day would accomplish, though I'm always for a ceasefire because at least it's possible as opposed to the current situation where it's not. And during that same interview, Blinken was asked uh, at point blank by the, uh, the host of the show, uh, but is, is Netanyahu on board with this? Is this, does he agree that this is the best thing, that this is needed? And he tried to say yes, but with a caveat. He said, yeah, kind of. I mean, it's in his interest to do so. But they tried and they tried to keep going back. And they said, yeah, but he said some other things besides that, like he doesn't want that. And Blinken just kind of ignored it and kept going on and trying to explain why all these things were actually positive. And from his perspective and being Netanyahu, it, it's a win. And so he needs that. So it looks again like we're setting ourselves up for a position to where we're going to say something in public about what we want. And you remember, there has been several times in the past where Blinken has said that the Israelis have already signed off on this ceasefire, we're talking about Gaza in that case. And then Netanyahu comes back and says, yeah, no, there's not going to be any. Absolutely not. We don't want to even go down that road. So no. And of course, that's the way it turned out. Well, last night, uh, President Biden, when he was getting uh, on near his helicopter, was asked about the situation with the ceasefire. And here's what he said. President Joe Biden told reporters the call for a ceasefire is backed by several nations. We've been able to generate significant support in Europe, as well as the Arab nations who support this war not wide. The statement by the U.S., France and others calls for the implementation of a U.N. resolution established after the 2006 Lebanon war. So that, that's great. That's great that they get a, a lot of people being willing to say, yeah, let's have this. And of course, they're, when they say that uh, 2006 Lebanese war U.N. resolution, that's the one that calls for Hezbollah to go back north of the Latani River. But the, the other side says we're not going to do that because of the threat to from Israel. So they view it as a surrender uh, and, and, a, and an increase to the threat to them from Israel. So they're not going to do that. So that that's a, a, basically a dead letter as well, a dead hope, because the, the Hezbollah side sees no value in doing it. Well, we definitely know that what Netanyahu said, I just showed you what he said his objective are, that they're going to keep hitting and doing whatever it takes to get their true uh, their people to be able to go back into that strip that I showed you on the map. Now, here's earlier, I think this was yesterday, actually. Here's what the uh, the chief of the general staff for Israel, their, their senior military person, told some troops about what their objective were and what they need to be ready for. The goal is very clear, to safely return the residents of the north. To achieve that, we are preparing the process of maneuvering, which means your military boots, your maneuvering boots, will enter enemy territory. That's, that's as point blank as you can get. He's saying that in order to achieve what you just heard their commander in chief's Netanyahu's statement was he's going to bring the people back. He just told his guys on camera for everybody to see in Israel, because that was in their language, that we are going to have to, our boots are going to have to go on the ground. And I've told you there's already been the 98th division has been moved up in that area. Two additional brigades uh, have been mobilized from the reserves. That's moving up there. Everywhere you look, there is there's they've actually been doing some rehearsals basically. On the ground, the Israeli military has specifically for invading into the north. Everything that you can see says they're going to go forward. And if anyone had any doubts about what Netanyahu thinks about the 21-day ceasefire, he removed that today. As you see this headline uh, that Gary is going to toss up there in just a second, that he said, no, we're, we're not going to. There's not going to be a ceasefire. Uh, he said it's false. It's just flat out. And and how many times do I have to show comments, whether a headline or a, a quote like this from Netanyahu that directly contradicts what the United States is saying? You see, it's still, we always go back to this. Who's running the show here? Who's in charge? And and listen, if this is just the U.S. And, and, and some other nation having disagreements over stuff, okay, fair enough. People have different, different differences of opinion on some things. And Israel is a sovereign nation. It can do what it wants. But here's the problem with that. 
our national security is directly tied in with this. We've already lost three Americans killed and uh, quite a number of others wounded because of the ramifications of this war that was started uh, by Israel when they went into the Gaza Strip following the terrorist attack that happened on the October 7th of last year. Now, I will repeat here again, Israel was completely within its rights to respond to that terrorist image, which killed literally hundreds of Israeli civilians. No question about that. Categorical, they had that. But what they didn't have the authority to do and the freedom to do is to just wantonly go and destroy an entire region's way of life and to kill tens of thousands of innocent people. And then to, to, ex to cause ramifications, this, that the war was expanded first to the Houthis, where now our Navy is on a, a perpetual open-ended mission to try and keep the, the, the uh, Red Sea traffic open in that area. Ironically, that benefits China more than any other nation, but we'll talk about that in a later time. But some of the bigger issues is that it has animated and activated a lot of these militia, these Iran-backed militia from the area, and they say that they can't go against Iran directly, so they're trying to hit the periphery, which was American troops, and they've been trying with uh, rockets, mortars, drones, and several things, a number of which have gotten through, and in, uh, I think it was February or January of this year, uh, three Americans were killed in the process of that. So we are already have suffered. So when we say it's in our interest for this war to come to end, we have definite uh, assets in the region where we need this to end because the threat to our people remains high. But we still are unwilling to use our leverage, and we're continuing to let uh, Iran, uh, Israel continue to run roughshod over this. Uh, now, it's it's not just uh, Netanyahu. So uh, he has rejected this, but uh, part of the reason why, and maybe this is the reason why, he sees he's got his cover at home. Here's what some of the people interviewed in Israel think about the possibility of a ceasefire regarding Lebanon. I think that we must to finish with this problem with the, the Hezbollah and uh, also with, uh, with Gaza. We must to finish with this, for, not for the, the people there, but for the, the, the government, for the, the, the men that they, they, We must to finish with this. To kill them, to, to stop them, to, to, to do something. But not, this, not stop the, the, the war, no. I have a shop here. I lose a lot of money. We lost all our uh, happiness. People are very, very sad about this situation. And we don't want to stop the fire. We want to stop the situation for life, not for one or two years. That's all. I'm happy that we started to um, take, in char take in charge about what's going on here, because for the past 11 months, it just it felt like we've been abandoned. And now, well, personally, I'm happy that the government has started to do something in Lebanon that we're uh, handling the situation and not just letting it happen. And it's not just the people there as well. It's the uh, many of the Israeli leaders uh, also. The, the Israeli media is reporting today that there's a lot of people ag against any kind of uh, proposal. In fact, you see there that the regional leaders have slammed the U.S.-French proposal to have a ceasefire because they don't want one. And in fact, even one of the members of um, Netanyahu's government, Ben Gavir, one of his cabinet members, said he would actually resign and boycott the coalition, the, the wartime governmenting coalition, if a ceasefire is signed. So he's everywhere you want to look, Israelis up and down the line, from Netanyahu all the way down to people on the street, they don't want a ceasefire. They want a, a military victory. So where does that leave us? What is that? What does that put us at the region? I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that map back up here that I showed you just a second ago, uh, because you need to understand what's what's at stake here. Now, uh, uh, this again is this is the borderline between Israel and Lebanon, and you see all of these uh, villages and these towns in this area here, and you can see the terrain. And I've talked to you about this before, but I just cannot reemphasize strongly enough from a military perspective, this is an incredibly incredibly difficult task to be able to push back. Yeah, I mean, just look at all these different villages and you see the more I zoom in uh, that there are more and more of them show up. And some of them are large, some of them medium, uh, some of them small size, but all this terrain in between here, which is just uh, ideal for defensive positions. And, and we know that the Hezbollah fighters uh, have plenty of resources that they've been getting open-ended. And you see, unlike the Gaza Strip, and, and let me run down and show you that for comparison, 
So here is the Gaza Strip, and you see that it's physically hermetically sealed. Both uh, Israel commands to see here, so nothing can come in and out without their knowledge. And then there are physically fences around. So all of the fighting for the last 11 months has taken place just in here where Israel controls literally everything. But now you get up into the area up here into the north and you see in the regional area, Israel is not control of any of this stuff. So things can come in from the sea. They can come in from Syria, obviously very friendly to, to anything that's going on there from the Hezbollah side. Uh, and this is also not far from uh, from Iran. You know, for here's Iraq here, but then Iran uh, is over here and it can also and does routinely fly things in and support and they can also send it in by sea. So there's th there's no way that you can control this area here. And, and where would you where would you fight to? Would you want to put to the so-called blue line? You you heard mention in there this uh, this this line from the uh, 2006 United Nations resolution that said that uh, Hamas uh, Hezbollah has to move back north of the what's called the blue line, which is the Latani River, which is roughly in this area up here. So that's quite a ways back. That's like 25 kilometers here of some of the most difficult terrain, folks. Israel doesn't have a military that can handle that. They're not big enough to, to be able to sustain the amount of combat that they can do there while they also still have to worry about the fight down here in the Gaza Strip. This one's not going anywhere either. And if these guys, the, the, the Hamas folks, uh, after 11 months when they're basically sealed off and it's extremely difficult for them to get any resupplies, yet somehow they are able to still do it and they're still able to continue to resist. What does anybody think is going to happen up here where it's wide open and especially anything through uh, Syria can come right in at any point? So there will be no shortage of any amount of ammunition, weapons, uh, probably men, manpower as well. Uh, there is likely going to be folks willing to fight from other countries to come in here because of their, their hatred for Israel. So if, if Israel starts this process up here, it's not a zero-sum deal to where, okay, if you just push them up to the Latani River, bam, problem solved. Because now then what? You're going to, even if you did that, then you would have to, to uh, uh, garrison this area more. And you would have to basically occupy it. And then to those who may not be aware, there was uh, from, I believe it was 1982 to the year 2000, Israel did occupy uh, Lebanon, lots of Lebanon. And they, they it was just a complete drain on their economy. And the Israeli economy is already severely damaged because of 11 months of this war so far, which still they're having to spend a lot of money there. A lot of their manpower is actually in the army fighting this, and they're not in the in the economy so that they're losing there. And, of course, one of the biggest sources of income for Israel is the tourist industry. And, and, and that has been dramatically dropped because of all the fighting that's going on naturally. This is only going to exacerbate that. If Israel goes in on the ground here and all evidence appears that's exactly what's going to happen, literally within days it could happen from now. If that does, it's going to draw, cause the, the tourism, What remarkably, there is still some going on. That's going to go down even more as the potential for this ex war widening, possibly even beyond the, uh, the Lebanon then that's going to cause more troops to have to fight. They're going to have to call up more reserves, which is going to take them further away from their own economy. Uh, and then now then you're talking about a lots of casualties too. Now, a lot of those people that we just showed in the interview there in Israel, uh, you know, they're saying, yeah, we, we want you to take care of this. Well, that's all well and good until the casualties start mounting. Because <clears throat> if people see that there's, there isn't a military plan, and there isn't a path to uh, to solve the problem militarily like they want, then believe me, they will not hesitate to turn on that same government they're applauding right now. Because, and part of it's understandable, they're being told, hey, this is what we're going to do to solve it. We're going to take care of you. So they believe that that's what's going to happen. They believe they see this great military power, and they think, yeah, we're going to do that <clears throat> because that's what the government told us. But what happens when the reality doesn't happen that way? I mean, already you've had 11 months of promises of complete and total victory. Netanyahu's own word about the Hamas war. It's not over. It's still being fought. And now then they've taken all of the objectives, military objectives. They've literally serviced every target that even theoretically existed. And yet it hasn't been quelled. The violence isn't over yet. They still have to fight. 
And you can count on it. If the Israeli army moves into the northern front, I assure you Hamas will do everything it can to continue sniping in the background to make sure that Israel isn't able to move more of its combat power out of Hamas, uh, the Gaza Strip and up into the north there. So they'll have to fight a two front war and they just don't have the manpower for that. And now then that all assumes that, that t- it assumes two big things here that the biggest issue for Israel is just the economic stuff, the the manpower issue and the the domestic political support and the casualties that would come in. That doesn't even count on what would happen if if Hamas unleashes its missile artillery, its missile support, its rocket artillery, its regular artillery, but that they've allegedly got over 100,000, many of which are uh, some of the higher quality missiles. If they launch these things in in large scale, which they haven't done yet, they would certainly overwhelm the Iron Dome system. I mean, it's just a mathematical issue. Even if they're crummy rockets, even if they're not very good, every time you send up a rocket in there, at least one interceptor missile has to be fired, sometimes more than one. And, And if you fire enough missiles and the Israeli side doesn't have enough interceptor missiles, then you can see it won't take very long at all until there is no air defense. And then once that happens, then it, then Hezbollah can now start firing some of its higher quality stuff that will make penetration. And we've seen already in Tel Aviv, there was one missile that was fired by Hezbollah that uh, was uh, apparently went through all the layers of defense and then was shot down at the very last over the top of Tel Aviv. Now, they celebrated that because it shot it down, but there was a lot of concern as to why did it make it all the way there before it finally got hit? Why didn't the arrow system knock it down before then, which is what it's supposed to do? And that was one missile, one one single missile, not a wave, but just a single one. What happens when there are scores, many scores and multiple waves? And then they come one right after the other. I mean, even if you have the interceptors, there's this physical issue of resupplying and reloading the the uh, the systems, which is not something. It's not like a, a a rifle where you can just take out a magazine and pop another one in. These things take time. And if and if Hezbollah does it wisely and and in terms of s- sequencing, they won't have time to do that, or they may run out altogether. And I'm promising you, if it gets to that. Hezbollah has the ability to really hurt Israel and to hit targets badly, you know, important targets. So Israel has a lot of risk if they continue to ignore the United States. That also um, um, uh, suggests that there's an issue uh, that that the war stays in Lebanon. But if it expands into Israel, I mean, into Iran, then you see that now that you have a, the, a whole regional possibility here. And listen, I, I, I continue to argue that the evidence supports this contention. That it has been Netanyahu's desire for months to start these wars. He has no interest in a ceasefire because he wants the war to expand. And I think that he wants Iran to join in because we have given unbelievable signals, ridiculous signals, frankly, from our senior leaders it says if Iran gets involved, then we will defend uh, Israel. There is, listen, that is so off the charts crazy from our perspective. We shouldn't even contemplate that. We should be read uh, dramatically clear to Netanyahu behind the scenes and says, if you spark a war with Iran, you're on your own. We ought to say that about Lebanon. We ought to say, we do not support this. It is bad for the region. It's bad for everybody. We're not going to be part of it. If you launch an attack into Lebanon, you are on your own and we're not going to support it. We should point blank tell them that. Now then, that means that Israel, that, uh, Israel will have to calculate differently. If they think, hmm, if I have to use only my own forces and the only the ammunition that we can make, I don't have enough to go into to win a war there. We would start, but I couldn't finish. Okay, we better use something different. Ceasefire, let's go with that. Do some other things. Make some whatever compromises are necessary to get all these wars off the table. Start working on diplomacy and trying to figure this stuff out. At least stop the killing. That could be done. And if you knew your resources were limited, then you would have motivation to go down that path. But when instead you have the motivation or the reality that the United States has said, despite all these public proclaim proclamations that I just put on there about pro the Secretary of State and the President himself, here's what we're doing today. After all of this, 
the U.S. announces an $8.7 billion uh, security package for Israel. Now, what message do you think that sends? So we've already had direct statements by the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, and the National Security Advisor, I believe, at various times, have said we would come to Israel's aid if Iran gets involved. And now then we've given them this money. So we are telling Netanyahu no, unambiguously, do whatever you want. I, I know that we genuinely don't want that, but that's the message that we have unequivocally sent because we are so feckless and so pathetically weak in terms of leadership ability that we won't ever hold Israel responsible. The main reason is because we're terrified. Our politicians are terrified of the loss of Israeli money in the, in the political arena here. Uh, the, the Israeli lobby has been very, very pro prolific in sending lots of money, millions and millions of dollars into the American political system. And everybody who does what they want gets showered with cash, especially if they have any influence. And those that don't play along, especially we've seen two Democratic members of Congress be defeated in the primaries this season, expressly by the, the APAC money because they didn't support the Israeli government blindly. They literally got them to lose their job. That message, that shot is sent across the bow. Now then the whole political arena is afraid of Israel, both the right and the left, Democrats and Republicans. And the, the, the consequence of that is that now then the political leadership in Tel Aviv has a free hand to do whatever it wants. And so we are going to give them our armed forces if, they, if, if the war expands into Iran. In Iran now, that 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 fact may keep them out of this war. We'll see. Uh, but but it appears that, that Netanyahu is going to roll the dice and is going to go into Lebanon on the ground. It could literally happen any day. It's almost hard to imagine him not now because he's put everything out there to say that he's going to. Because in that clip I showed you at the beginning here where he says, we will do whatever it takes to be able to move our people back in. You had the general, uh, the commanding general there say that our boots are going to go on the ground so that we can bring those 70,000 people back. If they don't go in on the ground, these airstrikes aren't going to stop anything. They'll continue on. So they won't be able to move back in South. The only way is if they have a ground incursion to try and push Hezbollah back. That's what's absolutely necessary. If they don't go in on the ground, now then they can't meet that promise. And I assure you, the people in Israel are going to be really upset about it. So you see, everybody's tied into a, a box right now. Uh, the Netanyahu's tied himself into a box with his own people. We've tied ourselves into a box with the Israeli leadership. And now then it remains to be seen how risk averse, I guess, and, and uh, restrained Tehran is because that's what the one thing right now that's basically keeping the whole thing uh, exploding into a regional war. And that is embarrassing that we're relying on a restraint out of Iran to keep this thing from blowing up. And look, and I know Netanyahu's not the only one. There's many in America that have just been salivating for a, a war with uh, Iran. You, you know, Jack Keane, we've shown many clips over the months to where he keeps on just relentlessly saying, you have to go after Iran. We have to go after Iran. Uh, uh, Lindsey Graham in the Senate is routinely saying this, but there are plenty of others that keep doing that. So there's a lot that are egging this on. And you see just everywhere you want to look, the, there's all this pressure for war. And, and there's these people that keep dying in the Gaza Strip. There's people that, that are now dying all over the place in, in Lebanon. Uh, hundreds of them, thousands more are being wounded by the airstrikes so far. And that's in addition to the pagers and whatever else. This is just wiping out all kinds of people. And there's every reason to believe that that death toll is, is only going to increase very soon. And we just have to hope and pray that either through blind luck or that finally President Biden recognizes that there's nothing to gain from uh, from continuing a war and finally puts his foot down. That's what should happen. But with all of these forces, it's just uh, it's just really troubling. And and of course, you know, I, I talked about the Iranian issue. Well, if you're talking about an Iranian issue, then you also have to talk about a Russian issue. 
because we, if we give, we've already given permission to the Ukraine side to use weapons in Russia. The the real issue, if you saw our show earlier today, was talking about the long range stuff could trigger a, an expansion of that war. Go in and watch that video to get all those details here. But we've already given shorter range stuff and an authorization to use things in Russia with our weapons in the in the periphery of the Russian land. Putin has had said months ago that because of that, he now does not see any reason to tie his own hands and is willing to send weapons and ammunition to American adversaries elsewhere. Now, we know that there's some deals made already at the highest levels between Russia and Iran. So there is reason to think that Iran has either air defense or missile capability or, or other kinds of uh, scientific rocket issue uh, technology that they have been given that will make this stuff more effective over time. That remains to be seen as well. So if we expand it, that's another potential uh, escalation of the war. All of these things are bad for us. And I, I, I just really hope that Biden finally recognizes uh, the just the basically grabbing a tiger by the tail, how unwise this is and brings this to an end. That's what needs to happen. And we're going to continue to follow this issue uh, as, as things develop. Count on Daniel Davis Deep Dive to keep giving you the real story about what happens. It's not just these sound bites like you saw on MSNBC today, but we give you the real deal underneath it. Count on us to keep doing that. Thanks very much. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have uh, Colonel Jacques Beau back, uh, one of our absolute favorites, uh, somebody I, I loved having on the show because his insight and his understanding, especially of things from a NATO perspective, is just nearly unmatched. We're going to have him back on tomorrow. Don't want to miss that. One o'clock Friday afternoon, and we'll see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.